Episode 38, Guaranteed versus Non-Guaranteed, Understanding Whole Life Cash Values. Hi, everybody. This is John Montoya. And this is John Parings. We're authorized infinite banking practitioners and hosts of the fifth edition. In this episode, we'll discuss the difference between guaranteed versus non-guaranteed values within a whole life policy. Why having a foundation of guarantees is arguably the most important detail in setting up a family banking system, and we'll revisit what distinguishes a contract from an investment. Excellent. I think this will be a great episode. We, you know, we've touched on this information in the past, uh, but we've never really focused a full episode on it, and it is something that is not that well understood even by some agents that I talk to, you know, there's, there's definitely some misconceptions about guaranteed versus non-guaranteed where the guaranteed fits in, you know, what type of growth you're going to get from a guaranteed basis and, you know, what the total growth is with the guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. So I think this will be a good episode and it'll help us just clarify what's actually happening with the growth of a whole life policy designed for infinite banking. Yeah, and I think also, too, from the proper mindset about IBC as well, I I do want to hit on, even though we're discussing the performance of a contract, we have to remember that IBC itself is not about the return on the capital. It is more about establishing a system, a financial system, where you take ownership and control of your money. The guaranteed aspect of these policies just allows it to perform at an optimal level from day one all the way through to the end of your life. Great point. I mean, we, we say that all the time. This is a a process, not a product. And this is about, you know, if you, if you understand infinite banking, the main point is not the rate of return you get on the life insurance policy. It's about the ability to create layers of returns or multiple returns with the same money at the same time. And that's really where the power of infinite banking comes in. You know, that's where the growth comes in. That's where the control comes in, which is probably, you know, might be more important than anything, having that control. Yeah. I think freedom, right? Freedom to do what you want with your money when you want and you control everything. That at the heart of things, you know, that that's what IBC allows us to do. And and the people who get stuck on the fact that we're utilizing a life insurance policy, they might not ever understand it because they focus on what the product is that we utilize for IBC instead of what it actually does for them. So let that sink in a little bit, but let's uh, dig into guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. Let's do it. All right. So guaranteed values. This is the year-by-year performance guarantee that is detailed out to age 121. So you're talking about a contract that is providing you with a minimum guarantee, a floor, if you will, that your capital is going to grow every single year until the day you pass or until age 121. So This is a foundational piece to an overall portfolio. It's not your entire portfolio. This is a portion of it that allows you the peace of mind knowing that no matter what else is going on in the world, politically, economically, maybe whatever else you're doing with your own investments, this is the one place where you can park money and know that it's going to increase in value every single year for the rest of your life. No luck, skill, or guesswork required to make this work. And that's what makes the guaranteed portion of this contract so important. It's going to work regardless of what you do or what's happening in the world outside of you. It's a contract that's guaranteed to perform every single year. I like to describe this when I'm talking to clients and even other agents is there are two growth components to a whole life insurance policy. There's the guaranteed, which is contrary to popular opinion. It's not really an interest rate growth. It's really an actuarial calculation. You can back into an interest rate knowing the actuarial calculation and they'll, they'll describe 
using an interest rate, they'll describe the rate of growth of the guaranteed. And that is typically around 4%. What's important to understand about that 4% is that's a gross number. It doesn't take into account costs, fees, commissions, all the costs of running the business. It doesn't account for that. What's important is you have to really take a look at the guaranteed ledger to understand what you're truly getting with the guarantees, which are net numbers that with dollar amounts that tells you exactly what you're getting. So that's the first growth component. The second component is the non-guaranteed component, and that's the dividend. You're never guaranteed to get a dividend, but when you do, that's the second piece that is added on to the to the total growth of the policy. And one of the things that I always like to point out to people is that all the life insurance companies that we utilize for creating these IBC whole life policies, these family banking systems, all the carriers that we use have been around for at least 100 years. They're A-rated. And the most important detail to me, they've never missed paying a dividend, not even one year. And so if you're looking at an illustration that comes along with your contract and you're trying to figure out, well, what's the difference between guaranteed versus non-guaranteed? It's just simply that column, the, the dividend projection. On the guaranteed side, you have the ultimate worst case scenario where the life insurance company is showing you that a dividend will never be paid out. Something to keep in mind is that with the companies that we utilize for IBC, that's never even happened in one year. And so when I look at the difference between the guaranteed and the non-guaranteed, I ask myself, well, which one is actually more likely to happen? Right? Is it the guaranteed, which no dividends ever, or the non-guaranteed, which does project out the last year's current dividend scale for all future years? And I lean towards the non-guaranteed, but that's just me. Yeah, and, and if we were to talk about one of the hardest hurdles that we have to overcome when explaining infinite banking to someone who's, who's new to it, we could probably say that the capitalization period ranks up there with the top things that are hard to, you know, kind of get your head around because a lot of people will look at the capitalization period. And what that means is there's a period of time where the premium that you pay, you don't have that full cash value available to you um, in the whole life policy. And what's interesting to note when looking at guaranteed values versus non-guaranteed values during that capitalization period um, they're actually very close. And so it's an interesting thing to look at where that capitalization period, you know, we don't have to worry too much about whether or not dividends are even being paid, even though, as you mentioned, you know, they've been paid every year for over a hundred years with the top companies that we use. It's It becomes one of those things where it's like, hey, this is going to perform, especially during the capitalization period, very similarly to what we're projecting, whether it's guaranteed or non-guaranteed. Yeah, good point. And so let's talk a little bit more about the non-guaranteed value. So again, that's the dividend. One of the things with a whole life insurance policy, and in our in our last episode, we touched on universal life policies, which are very much, the growth of which is very much based on the performance of the market where it's going to be tied to some market performance, whether if it's variable universal life, it's tied directly to the market performance, or if it's universal or indexed universal life is one of the more popular ones. Now it's going to be tied to an index and the costs are actually separate from the performance of the, the growth performance of the policy. Whereas whole life, which is different, all of the costs are baked into the policy. And so what they do is they assume the lowest performance growth on the guaranteed side and the highest costs. And when the life insurance company outperforms those, that's where the dividend actually comes from. They're essentially assuming the worst case scenario. And that's why over for over a hundred years, they've outperformed the worst case scenario, which is where the dividend comes from. And the technical you know, term of a dividend is really a return of premium. And that's why it gets paid back and as a as a mutual part owner of a mutual company, that dividend or return of premium is sent back to the policy owner. And that contributes to part of the growth of the policy. And that's why we can have such strong guarantees for up to age 121. And that's why the policy can endow. And so that's why 
whole life insurance is really the the recommended vehicle for practicing infinite banking because of all the guarantees built into the policy. For a deeper dive into dividends, we did do an episode, episode number 31, that I think you should check out as well. So if you're listening to this episode, uh, make sure to take a quick visit to episode 31 for reference. John Montoya on top of things. I didn't have that uh, episode number pulled up, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. I wanted to touch on one other quick thing regarding guaranteed values. Here's something that's amazing, but a lot of people don't put much thought into it because most people kind of look at this when they're thinking about buying a whole life insurance policy and they look at the guaranteed values. And as John Montoya mentioned a second ago, the guaranteed values are if a dividend was never earned at all, right? Ever. And so that's, that's what the guaranteed column looks like. However, as we've been saying, we haven't really experienced a time with these, with the carriers that we use where they didn't pay a dividend. But even if they, even if they missed a year, that doesn't mean, you know, that's what you're going to get the guaranteed column, right? You're, it it might look different than the non-guaranteed column, but you also wouldn't get the guaranteed column. Now here's, here's something that's really interesting and powerful when we look at how these are set up. Every time a dividend is paid and every time that dividend is applied to your policy, that becomes the new guaranteed basis. And so the guaranteed column, as the as time goes on and your policy matures, your guaranteed column, because once a dividend's applied, it can never be taken out, it can never be withdrawn, it becomes the new the new base from which that policy's guarantees start to grow. And so it it the guaranteed column as a policy matures starts to look more and more like the non-guaranteed column, but now it's guaranteed. So that's a, I think that's a, a really powerful thing to think about in terms of what you're actually going to get over the long term from a guaranteed standpoint using a whole life insurance policy. Yeah. The way that I would think of it is that this simply gets better the longer you own it. And how many things in life can we say that about? That's true. Well, why don't we delve into the next part, the most important detail in setting up a family banking system. I would argue, and there's many things to choose from here, but I would argue that the guaranteed portion of what you get with a whole life, the guarantees in in these contracts is what makes it so unique and and really vital for setting up a financial system. So let's delve into that. Whole life policies are a one of a kind turnkey ready made financial system that is created each time you open up a new whole life policy. IBC practitioners who've been around will recall that Nelson Nash was fond of saying every time a person buys a life insurance policy, they are starting a business from scratch. That business, of course, is a private family banking system. It's a business between you and the life insurance company what Nelson would refer to as the you and me level. Of course, you do have to read between the lines of the contract to fully grasp the idea of infinite banking. This is where the majority of people who first stumble upon IBC really get stuck in the weeds because they only see it as a life insurance policy and they get stuck. I once heard Nelson say that calling this financial system a whole life policy is probably one of the worst things the life insurance industry has ever done. Because right from the start, the life insurance industry provided a label that continues to confuse people to this day. The smallest minds see a life insurance policy, and that's all it will ever be to them. But for those of you who take the time to read Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, you listen to our podcast, which now we're up to 30 plus episodes. This is episode 38 all related to infinite banking, and you speak to an authorized IBC practitioner, you're going to realize what Nelson said from the beginning. The infinite banking concept is an idea. It is not about life insurance. It's about controlling the banking function at the you and me level to root out rent sinking traditional banking systems that will have you believing what Nelson would refer to as their lies, lies, lies. I can still hear him saying it. And what is the biggest lie of all? That you need a traditional bank 
to control your banking function in order to finance all the major capital expenditures in your lifetime. This is simply not true. But of course, we're not taught that anywhere, not through 12 years of government schooling, through the different higher education degrees that you can get. Nothing prepares or teaches you for the history of money and the importance of banking. But that's what we do with IBC. And I think it's super important to really understand that point where what we're talking about is the banking function. And so if you were to talk to you know, someone who's, say, a real estate investor, and you were to ask them the question, hey, if you could do no money down acquisitions of real estate, would you, would you want to do that? And they would, of course, I think that most of them would say yes, you know, and, but the way most people buy real estate is they'll go to the bank, they'll get 80% of the purchase price, and then they'll put up the other 20%. And if you ask them, Hey, if you could not put up that 20%, would you do it? And they'd say, yes, I think the question comes, what are the ways you could do a no money down type of transaction? And there are a lot of people know there are ways to do that. And usually the financing comes from someone else, right? Maybe it comes from a hard money lender. Maybe it comes from the seller themselves. But someone is financing the other 20% of that deal. So the question is, who is that other person? Is it, again, a hard money lender? Is it the seller? Why shouldn't it be you? As we're talking about the banking function during this talk, if you think about, well, who's the other person financing the rest of this? the rest of this deal, why shouldn't that be you? You know, And that's one of the things that I think is, is hard to get across because people, people look at this as a, either like a bank account and they compare it to you know, them, them paying cash rather than thinking about themselves as the financier of purchasing other assets. They can be the purchaser of the asset and they can also be some or all of the financier to do the transaction. And I think that gets lost sometimes when people are just looking at life insurance illustrations and trying to understand where the value is, looking at illustration values. So today we're talking about guaranteed and non-guaranteed values. Well, you know, what's the what's the other option? Are you thinking of yourself as a as a bank or a financier? Because if that's the case, you're not looking at this like a like you're putting money into a savings account. You're looking at this as, what am I doing with my money? How can I sell this inventory to get a profit off of that side of the transaction as well? You're going to get a profit off the purchase of the asset. And if you're the financier, you'll get a profit off financing the transaction as well. And it's guaranteed to work. So to to bring it back to the guaranteed values and why this is so important, well, only a whole life policy provides you with a legal framework for a financial entity that is guaranteed to increase in value every single year for the rest of your life. If you think of all the different places where you can park your capital, this is the only place that I've personally come across where you can direct money and know that not only is it going to grow every single year, but you're going to have access to it and be able to utilize it without interrupting the compounding growth. And it starts with that framework of guarantees that can only be found in a whole life policy. So that's why I think it's arguably the most important detail that we should discuss in starting an IBC policy because without that foundation, without these guarantees and the legal framework of a whole life policy, IBC simply wouldn't work the same way. These policies are essentially the safest place where you can park money and then leverage in and out of it to acquire more assets. And it brings up some other things to keep in mind. There are you know, things that we've heard out there. One of the common objections is, well, why would I put my money here when I could put it somewhere else and get, get more growth? And so this is sort of mindset of putting your money into investments or you know, like a 401k or IRA, something like that. And the problem with this way of thinking is they're they're conflating different types of assets. By the way, I hear this probably the most surprisingly from real estate people where 
they'd say, well, why would I put my money into this when I can put it into my IRA or, you know, into the stock market and earn, you know, a higher rate of return. And, and so to me, it's like, well, it depends. Are you a real estate investor or are you, a, you know, a stock market person? Because if your capital is, is supposed to be for buying real estate, why on earth would you want to put your capital somewhere where you could lose money? And, and so it, it kind of doesn't make sense to me. And so people misunderstand the types of assets that we're talking about. And infinite banking and whole life insurance is a cash asset, right? So if you compare the, the attributes of whole life insurance to some other like asset, that has the liquidity and the guarantees of, of that type of asset, it blows anything else out of the water. And it gets to the, the idea of looking at things as investments versus contracts, right? And so one of the, one of the oldest wealth analytics tools out there is called, it's a software called Leap. And they, they talk about statement wealth versus contractual wealth. And where statement wealth is when a client gives their money to an institution or an organization in the hopes that, you know, they can get their money to grow, obviously. And in this arrangement, the giver of the money assumes all the risk for the growth of that money, right? And the organization, all they do is they send a statement one to four times a year telling them how they're doing at any given point in time. So that's statement wealth. You basically see your wealth on a piece of paper and what does that actually mean in terms of what that wealth is doing for you? And what does that mean in terms of what that wealth is going to look like in the future? On the other side of the spectrum, you have contractual wealth. And this is when a client gives money to someone else or an organization as part of a contract. And that's where the recipient of the money assumes the risk, right? When you look at things this way, a lot of, not a whole lot of what we have available out there is really contractual wealth. There's not a whole lot that the, uh, the, the recipient of the money takes on all the risk for providing the, the growth of that asset. Whereas most, most things out there are more statement-based wealth as opposed to contractual wealth. Yeah. Another way to think of it is skin in the game, right? When you set up a whole life policy, the life insurance company has skin in the game because you are transferring the risk of performance over to them. That only happens with a whole life policy, by the way, where you get those contractual guarantees that what you want to have happen will happen, even if you're not around to see it. And what I'm referring to there, obviously, is the tax-free death benefit uh, later on when you graduate to the next level. But keep in mind, IBC is very much a contract. It's not an investment. And the mindset that most people have coming into IBC is chasing rate of return. And so we, we have to fundamentally root that out. And it's a hard thing to do. As Nelson would say, 70% of people will get it. And the other 30% won't. And hopefully, you know, our listeners are part of that 70% and they start to see IBC as an idea and they realize this is contractual wealth, like how you're describing it. And they see that, well, they're setting up a foundation for wealth building for their entire life. And that idea, contract versus investment, this is very much contractual wealth. I like the way that you put that. Yeah. and and. It's more, you know, just circling back on what we've been saying, it's more, it's more than just the growth of the asset. It's creating a platform that allows us to kind of turn the axis of our money. Like if you look at a compound growth curve, it allows us to actually turn that maybe 45 degrees and look into it in, a, in three dimensions rather than just two dimensions on a page. And you start to see money um, cycling back and forth between buying, uh, buying things uh, or investing in other assets, using money multiple times, essentially accelerate the growth of your overall picture rather than just the growth of any single asset. And so leverage comes into mind and it's a form of safe leverage where the underlying value of the life insurance contract is guaranteed. Not a whole lot of other things out there that you can that you can use that prov- that you can 
get easy leverage and have those the underlying asset be guaranteed. So it's a safer way of using that leverage to make the growth of what you're doing even more powerful over the course of not only your life, but if you look at this from an intergenerational perspective, it starts to become extremely powerful. Yeah, I consider it a financial unicorn. Let's wrap up with a quick summary and just a reminder to our listeners. IBC working is not predicated on dividend performance and chasing rate of return like what you would have with any type of investment. It is a financial system, period. In order for a financial system to work, there must be a framework for money to move through it. And that's what we're establishing here with these IBC whole life policies. These contracts provide a framework for a financial system that allows you to control the flow of your own money back to you where it can grow uninterrupted and so that we can continue to use that money repeatedly in our lifetime to build generational wealth. Think of it this way. Instead of building beautiful fountains for the traditional banks, we can build our own. Well said. Well, I think that wraps up this episode, guaranteed versus non-guaranteed. And if you have any questions about what that can look like specific to your situation, you can feel free to reach us at the fifth edition.com. You can contact us right there. You can even set up an appointment if you want, no obligation, 30 minute consultation. And we can uh, find out how this could look in your life specifically. Thank you for listening, everybody.